Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Matt the Goblin Fiber here. Just got home from work, decided to have a pipe <clears throat> and make a video a day early. Um, after I made my video on Sunday, I decided to make myself another tamper. I bungled this one though. I didn't uh, I didn't drill my my center hole very well and because uh, I've been attaching um, these with um, a nail and then a, a bit of metal that I, I shape on the grinder afterwards and uh, when I drove the nail um, actually accidentally split the side there on that one so it's all right just keep practicing I think I'll definitely be using some shorter nails from now on or find another way to adhere it, but um, I really didn't want to use any kind of glue or epoxy or anything like that. Uh, I didn't want to have, I didn't want it to possibly impart some kind of flavor or gas off, you know, when it touches the, um, the tobacco um, as it heats up. So for now I went the safe route. I don't know if it's the right way, but it's, it's a way that works for me. So. I'm smoking some Capstan Blue in my The Good Deal, my Rat Trays. Um, I will say that it tastes uh, tastes better today than it did uh, on Sunday when I first opened that tin. Um, really does seem to pay to jar things up and just let it breathe for a couple days. And I'm assuming that it's going to be uh, even more, um, it would be even better next time. Um, definitely got that that vinegary uh, smell more on the nose um, than last time. Um, kind of reminds me of St. Bruno, which they're kind of similar, though I think St. Bruno has... Am I wrong? Does it have Kentucky in it? Oh, I can't remember now, but St. Bruno is one that I really like a lot, too. So, But anyways... Um, this is going to be the final installment of, um, of Poor Food, Tough Horses from OIV Trails, the West Forgotten Corner, using a pipe cleaner as a bookmark. How resourceful am I? Pretty impressive. So, we've only got a couple more pages. Um, I appreciate you guys, you know, watching the videos and having a listen. I know some of you enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, it might not be everybody's cup of tea, but it's something that I just wanted to kind of try out and do something a little bit different because I don't know about you guys, but I uh, have a hard time coming up with a reason to make a video, even if I want to make one, because I can't, it's, uh, not really, really don't have a whole lot to talk about most of the time. Um, I, I could tell you, um, what I did yesterday after work, <laughs> had to take my tear my dryer apart. Um, found out that the thermal fuse had blown on it, which is a very strong indication that you also have a plug in your exhaust vent. So after I uh, start uploading this video, I will be cleaning out the vent. Got one of the tools. Actually, you can see it right there, hanging on the wall. Oh gosh, right there. Yeah. One of those wiggly worms with the brush on the end. I'm gonna have a go at that. I uh, I just did it six months ago, so it makes me wonder if something something bypassed the the lint trap that shouldn't have and uh, got stuck in there. Anyways. I had CPR training at work this afternoon, three hours of that. Uh, it was good to uh, to re to retrain on that because it's been probably four or five years since we had a class last. So but it is uh, it was kind of nice though to have that three hour block 
in the uh, afternoon because I would say 90% of our work is, is outside. And it has been cold the last couple days. Uh, I think it was 17 degrees Fahrenheit this morning. So I've been wearing my thermals and bibs and the, the whole nine yards, wool socks, everything. Because it has been cold. Okay, enough of that. Let's finish up the story, shall we? Five minutes in. Um, <clears throat> if Henry Miller saw any hobos, he ordered the cooks to feed them. They were told never to turn away a hungry man. Here again, Miller had his own unique system. The cooks must make the visitor wait until the hands were fed, then give him a used plate heaped with food. His string of ranches was known among the vag vagabonds as the dirty plate route. But it was a practical means to an end. A happy hobo wasn't likely to burn Miller's haystacks. Miller never missed a bet. On an Oregon visit, he noticed that the island ranch kitchen lacked a meat grinder. Returning to his headquarters at Los Banos, California, Miller purchased a grinder. He discovered he wrote the island superintendent in checking the boat freight rates to the Dalles, which is on the Columbia River, that ship the grinder would cost as much as a hundred weight. Miller, therefore, took a hundred pound keg of staples, removed enough to accommodate the grinder, and shipped it in that way to get his money's worth. He also supplied the, su the super with specific directions on how to divide up the staples with the other ranches to avoid waste. Fence posts were another matter on which Miller saved by his own inventive system. As barren of so much land, replacing fence could be a very costly item. Miller insisted that the posts cut or purchased be long enough for several resets. Many were nine feet long, burned at the end to reduce the rotting. Still standing on ranches that belong to that company are posts that haven't rotted and which have two resets left in them. Can you imagine that? A wooden barbed wire fence still standing after so many years. I don't even think you can get that kind of longevity with pressure treated uh, wood. It's just amazing. Um, but a lot at that time too, um, they were using a lot of, from what I've heard, the mills were cutting a lot of old growth, which seems to be harder, um, more resistant to things like rot and, and whatnot. Um, I know people talk about that a lot around here when having an older house, one of the benefits is that it's built with old growth wood. And uh, mine, for example, was built in 1938 and um, it has some of that old style lumber that you just can't get anymore. Um, and uh, I have to say, it's standing up pretty well. with proper maintenance anyways. <clears throat> this tough cattle king observed things cryptically and with a steady calculating eye made his observations and gave his orders. It is not work that ruins so many horses but incompetent men handling them. Unbranded calves on their ranges is bad business as it might induce some of our neighbors to be dishonest. A friendly neighbor is a great asset. A man can't do justice to his employer on an empty stomach. It is no disgrace to ask advice from one holding a position beneath you. There is a class of people not made to be pro prosperous. The minute they have a jingle in their pocket or a dollar's credit, they are ruined and lose their bearings. Might be some, some wisdom in that. I mean, look at people uh, who win win the lottery. I don't know how many stories I've heard of people who win millions and millions of dollars and then within just a couple of years, it's it's all gone. But we all have different personalities and some of us are, are, uh, are, are uh, not great with money. If a man is sensible, he will not run his horse to death to get back a calf that runs away, but will let it come back on its own accord. 
Knowing these things is what makes a good cattleman. It is nonsense to keep up stock in summer and let them starve in winter. I hear that our supervisor has been defeated and his successor will probably give us a fair deal. I hope nothing has been said to cause him to feel that we have been working against his election. I am told your foreman voted against our supervisor. I can hardly believe that, but I shall find out. I wrote him explicitly that we not only wanted his assistance, but also that of his men who were registered and have them vote for our man. I have seen men trimming trees that were dead. They did not take pains enough to notice. Explain to the editor of the paper our standing with the people, and once in a while give him some advertising so that he will have a chance to make something which will have its good effect. I thought that a man was getting $50 a month, and now I find that we are paying him 65 We want to get rid of him as soon as possible. <laughs> John Gilchrist was for many years the superintendent for Miller and Lux on the Oregon and Nevada ranches. He was a loyal, trusted employee, one of the very few free, given free reign in handling company business. He was well liked by the men and by the neighbors. When age forced Henry Miller out of the driver's seat, a nephew took over management of the big cattle empire. He and Gilchrist didn't hit it off and the superintendent resigned. Arthur Olson, a Miller and Lux man from California, was selected to replace Gilchrist. From the beginning, he had trouble. Many of the hands and former employees still in the area refused to accept the new man, for they were loyal to Gilchrist. There was a generation gap, too. In those days, since Olson was in his early 20s and, only, and had only limited ranching experience and was considered a greenhorn, yet if he were to succeed, he needed to win the respect of the men under him. Riding the stage from Bend to Burns, Olson chatted with a man from Harney County. He told the fellow his problem. The weathered eastern or Oregonian advised him to call up Gilchrist, who was living in Burns, and give him the full story. Gilchrist listened intently, then promised Olson he would give Charlie Miller, the cattle superintendent, he would see Charlie Miller, the cattle superintendent, in a few days. He assured his successor that everything will be all right. It was the beginning of a strange relationship. As long as Gilchrist lived in Burns, Olson sought him out for advice on company business, and Gilchrist never hesitated in giving it. This was the kind of loyalty Henry Miller drew from his longtime top hands. Nevertheless, Olson continued to have his problems. Hands gave him cool treatment for a long while before finally accepting him in his authority. The Chinese cooks were especially rough and uncooperative. When Olson arrived late for a meal, the cook would set out anything handy, making no effort to give him something fresh and piping hot. But gradually, he broke them down. One afternoon, he rode up late to the ranch house, seeking a meal. Mr. Olson like steak? the cook asked. Olson knew that he was finally in. Gradually, too, Olson gained the respect of the other ranchers, except for one at the Harper's Ranch. One day Olson had been in Vail on business and decided to drive out to Harper Ranch for the night. He became lost, spending most of the night beside an irrigation ditch. Long before daylight, Olson froze out, so began driving again and reached Harper's in time to catch the foreman still in bed. The foreman was obviously embarrassed, caught without his pants. Olson told him he'd just come from Vail, but omitted the fact that he'd been lost all night. It was a stupid thing. The foreman would hold it against him. A few days later, Olson ran on to Charlie, ran on to Charlie Miller, who gave him some good news, repeating what the foreman said. Any son of a bitch that could come from Vail and catch me in bed in the morning just has to be a good man. <laughs> By the time of his death in 1916, Henry Miller had fulfilled his ambition of becoming the largest cattleman in the world. He owed no one, and there wasn't a mortgage on any of his holdings, but his personal life, like that of many men of wealth, ambition, and constant drive, had been a failure. His son was crippled, his daughter had been killed years before in an accident with a horse, and his wife was also dead. There was no one to carry on the business of that great empire. It was only a short time before it fell apart. No, well, nothing is forever. You know, when when we die, what, they say our name is remembered until the last person that knew us passes away, something like that. I might have butchered that, but I mean, it's true, and it doesn't matter what you build, it doesn't matter how much money you have, um, in the end, you're not taking it with you, and the people that inherit it, 
uh, aren't going to appreciate it because they didn't earn it themselves. Not that you shouldn't try, though. I mean, of course, if we didn't strive for something, nothing would ever get done. Great things of man would never have been accomplished. So that's just something to keep in mind. You know, it's, it's okay to have aspirations and be driven professionally, um, but it's also really important that you spend time and take care of the people that are important to you um, before you or they are gone. I hope you guys enjoyed that last uh, installment of uh, Tough Food or Poor Food, Tough Horses. And um, maybe sometime down the road, I'll pull out another story from this from this book here. Um, this one's very very based on uh, on information, kind of giving you an idea of what it was like uh, around um, the area in that time. Um, but some of these stories are much more comedic and. And adventurous and um, steeped in folklore so maybe at some point we'll do some more of those but um, until I talk to you guys next time have a good one um, thanks for watching the video and uh, talk to y'all later